There is this perception that, particularly down at the infrastructure level, most of the internet's problems are now well and truly solved. You know, we understand TCP, don't we? The same as we understand IP. You know, this is just a solved set of problems. But in some ways, we don't. And there is this curious interplay between software and hardware. And it's worthwhile sort of looking at hardware for a second first and just try and understand that silicon is not infinitely elastic. And in fact, on a silicon die, the chips are of a standard size. You can only get so many gates into a chip. You can't squeeze more in until you go to a new lithography process or whatever. So when you look at a switching chip, you've got to make some compromises. You can either have an enormous switch, but you've got no more space left on the chip for memory close to the switch, which means you've then got to fill up the rest of the chip with I.O. buffers and put the memory off the chip, but that's slow. But I'm searching for speed. If I'm really searching for switching speed, I need to do buffering, but the best place is on the chip. How much memory can I put on a switching chip? Well, between 16 and 64 meg. Now, just bear that figure in mind. 16 to 64 meg of really fast switching if I want to get it on a chip. I can get it for a few gigs if I go off chip, but it won't quite be as fast, and there are compromises in cost as well. It gets more expensive. So, how does TCP work? Because the real consumer of all this switching is generally the transmission control protocol, TCP. We kind of did most of the work in TCP about 30 odd years ago. TCP is an adaptive rate control algorithm. What it's trying to do right at the end, at each system, is to establish between the sender and the receiver how fast can the network go. So what TCP does is it actually works as a pacing protocol. If you think of the network as a conveyor belt of packets, as a packet leaves the network, you want to put a packet on. Or think of it as a freeway. As a car leaves the freeway, you put another car on. Now, if you do this just right, the freeway will never clog up. Because if there's 10 cars on the freeway, as car number one leaves, car number 11 joins and so on, there are always 10 cars on the freeway. So how does TCP do rate adaptation? It starts with this algorithm of flow control, ACK-based flow control, packet in, packet out. But while there are no problems, in other words, none of the packets got lost, it will gradually increase its sending rate. And because it knows the amount of time between sender and receiver, what we call the round trip time, in a steady state, with everything going fine, TCP will put one more packet on the network each round trip time interval. So slowly and surely, TCP will increase its rate. Now, networks aren't infinite. The line only has so much capacity. So at some point, when you put that extra packet in, it won't get all the way through. It will land up in a buffer. But you're still sending at that rate. So as long as you continue, the buffer starts to fill. And the next round trip time, you're now sending another extra packet. And so the buffer starts to fill more and more quickly. A full buffer gets relief at some point, and the relief is when the buffer's full and there's a new packet coming in, you drop it. That dropped packet becomes a signal in the ACK train to say, oops. And a little while later, the sender goes, oops. I've been sending too fast. I've got to send less. But think about the condition in the network. The network is full and at least one buffer is full. So if I back off ever so slightly, that won't help. I've actually got to back off low enough to allow that buffer to drain. And so the standard thinking in TCP was to halve your rate, rate halving. Because if I'm going so sort of this fast and I rate half, in theory, I'll go be below the network speed rate, the queue will drain, and then I gradually increase again. So we get this classic sawtooth pattern. But the issue is that's a really big coarse oscillation. 
from speed A to speed 2A is really fast, the, the really big. The other problem is, is that that linear increase is tediously slow. It can take weeks to get up to gigabit speed for a single session, particularly if it's a long delay. So something's not right. The first thing we did, and we did this for about 20 years, was tinker with this. That it's still loss-based avoidance. So you push TCP to a loss point, react violently, push TCP to a loss point. And the speed at which you get to that loss point is what we've been playing with. Change linear to a polynomial, x squared, x cubed. The current one in vogue is a polynomial function, x cubed. And so it sort of gets close to the point where you get lost and just sort of gradually moves in, in theory. So almost everyone runs cubic these days. It's a sloppy, inefficient protocol, but it's the best we know. It also needs big buffers. Remember where we started with buffers and switching? Because what cubic kind of assumes is that the buffer space is equal to the amount of traffic on the link that switch is driving, the delay bandwidth product. So to make cubic work, you need relatively large buffers in your network. Now, what we want is cheap and fast. And what we're getting is fast, but not so cheap. And we'd like something better. The, the insightful point of BBR was that actually what you want to do is to drive the network full, but the buffer's empty. So you need to sense the point where I've got just enough packets in the network that they're all going through. And if I add one more packet, it won't go through, it'll sit in a buffer for a little while. You just wanna very subtly get that inflection point where queuing starts. And the best way to do this is to measure the round trip time. You have a very accurate view of the time it takes when there is no queuing, as soon as you send something when there is queuing, you know, you've got feedback going, well, oh, that's just at the onset. So that's the theory. We tried this out many, many years ago. Larry Peterson, TCP, Lake in Nevada. I'm thinking Tahoe, but I could be wrong, whatever. Um, Larry Peterson was at the University of Arizona, as I recall. Um, it was way too polite because when you're competing with all these other protocols that also like, like Cubic, to fill up the queue, and you're sitting there going, oh, I'm seeing someone else's buffering, there's a problem. So BBR went to a different kind of mode of operation. And it's one that I think was really insightful. For six states of the time, it flies blind. It just knows the rate that it thinks it's got and just sends at it. For one round trip time, it increases its sending rate by 25%. It's not a lot. And then for the next round trip time, it drops its rate by 25%. Now, if I've got this right, and the sending rate is just on the onset of queuing, then the only time I actually get queuing is when I bump up the sending rate for one round trip time, and immediately after I drain it. So what you find in the queue is you can run really short queues that go blip, blip, blip. Fascinating. Um, I'm not using queue space. I don't need switches with large amounts of memory. And if I can tune it so that it makes a decent assumption quickly about the delay bandwidth product on the net, I can go blindingly fast with almost no impact on buffers and buffer memory. Nirvana tried it out on an empty wire it's Canberra to Melbourne, 10 gig wire, no other people, runs at 10 gig. Whoa, immediately. But then again, Cubic does a very similar job too when there's no one else around. So I put the two together. Run up Cubic, comes up to 10 gig. Run up a parallel version of BBR, it runs at 10 gig. It's only a 10 gig wire. What happened to Cubic? Oops. Because BBR in this particular case, had actually overestimated the delay bandwidth product and was actually running with the queues pretty full. So whenever Cubic tried to start up, it immediately encountered loss, flattened itself down on the floor, 
BBR can tolerate loss and still run up bandwidth. Whereas whenever Cubic sees loss, it goes, oh, sorry, excuse me, let me rate half again and again and again. So this is odd or interesting. I might BBR just wins. If this is bio biology at work, BBR looks like being the mammal. Cubic certainly looks like being the reptile here. And so we go, well, okay, let's try this on a long delay internet circuit. Now, I've never thought of the internet as fast for me. The internet has a lot of capacity, but there's meant to be lots of flows going on at the same time. So getting even 100 megabits per second between Australia and, say, Europe is kind of unusual. So I've started up. Lo and behold, I get up to 600 megabits per second. I didn't book any capacity, didn't do anything. It just did it. I run up a cubic session at the same time between the same two endpoints. Nothing. Everything's frozen out. BBR is working brilliantly. I run up a second BBR. They manage to sort of rate half between themselves, but still cubic is being stretched right out. It's just not getting any, any look in. There's something really fascinating about this. I'm like, I suppose the first lesson is this is an escalating war. And when you deploy a protocol like BBR that crowds all the other protocols out, you've either got to join in and run that protocol too, or I don't know, I think you're dead. Um, so yes, keep up. But the next lesson is actually surprising in some ways, and it is you can't look at the software of a network in isolation to the hardware of a network. And that when you really want speed, there are compromises being made at the silicon design level, such as I can't give you huge amounts of memory and extremely fast switching at the same time. And when I say fast, I mean aggregate capacities of hundreds of millions of packets per second, terabit style switches. I can't do that with a whole bunch of memory. You either get switching at speed or you get slower switching with a bunch of out outboard memory. BBR sort of says, okay, here your problem. Let's go cheap in the silicon and let's redesign the protocol to actually run the end-to-end -end system just at the point where I might need to consume memory. So I need a bit just to detect the fact that it's being consumed, but then I don't need any more than that. So you don't need these massive pools of buffer bloat. In result on all this, we always thought the long distance internet and the data center internet were different. That long haul, long delay, high speed, you know, across the continent, across the world, required a different tuning set to across the floor of a data center. BBR is kind of showing that's not true you can design an end-to-end -end protocol that actually performs brilliantly, I believe, and it's very aggressive. Make no mistake, it's very aggressive, but brilliantly over short and long delay paths at the same time. Um, and I suppose the next lesson, which is where I want to leave you with, is if anyone thinks that the internet is a solved problem and there's nothing left in protocol engineering and design, you are completely wrong we're still looking at these fundamental sort of questions of how do I tune the software and the hardware to produce cheap, efficient, fast networking. And to my mind, I think that's brilliant. That's it's a, a really good story coming out of work we're currently doing. So to the designers of BBR, thank you. I run it all the time. Uh, to everyone else who's got BBR on Linux, um, no, don't. Don't run it. Uh, I'm running it, okay? You shouldn't. Thank you.